Nibbana or Nirvana is not the only name the Buddha gave to the goal of his teaching. He also called it shelter, harbor, refuge. Because that's something we sorely need. As in the chat just now, the world offers no refuge, it offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. We come into life and we have some sense of protection that comes from our parents. But then as we grow up, we begin to realize that our parents are not as all-powerful as we thought. We have to depend more and more on ourselves. And we look at ourselves and how reliable are we? We're slaves to craving. We do so many things that cause us suffering not only for ourselves but also for other people. So who can you depend on? Where can you find true safety? It's in response to that need for safety that the Buddha offered his teachings. On a relative level, there's the safety of following the path. The safety you provide for yourself and for people around you when you're generous, when you follow the precepts, and when you meditate. Then there's the ultimate level of safety that comes from attaining the goal. You talk about the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha as refuge. The refuge both in the sense of giving us examples of how to find refuge for ourselves, and they become qualities in our mind. This is the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha on the internal level, the qualities that they stand for, like the ones we're developing right now, mindfulness, alertness, ardency. If you're not mindful, you forget all the lessons you've learned. If you're not alert, you don't really see what you're doing, and you're exposing yourself, yourself to all kinds of problems, all kinds of dangers. So it's important that we learn how to develop these qualities. Taking the Buddha as our example, taking the Dhamma and the Sangha as our example. taking that external refuge and bringing it in. Mindfulness means keeping something in mind. In this case, we're keeping the breath in mind, keeping the body in and of itself in mind. In and of itself in the sense that we're not concerned about how the body looks to other people or how strong it is, or whether we like our bodies or not, just the body as it simply is experienced right here and now. That's our frame of reference. You try to keep following it on those terms. That requires mindfulness, keeping it in mind, and then alertness, watching what you're doing. Sometimes alertness is translated as clear comprehension. And in the commentaries, it sloughs over into discernment, understanding the not-self nature of things, and gets quite elaborate. But in the canon, it means something pretty simple, just being alert to what you're doing. Because this is something we tend to miss. We're paying too much attention to other things. But if you want to see cause and effect, the first thing you've got to see are the causes. What are you actually doing? If you simply know the effects, but you can't remember what you've done and you weren't watching what you were doing when you did it, there's no way you're going to learn anything. So you want to be mindful, you want to be alert, so you can start seeing cause and effect. Because this is a knowledge that eats through your ignorance, 
and also chastises your craving. Because craving basically wants things that can't happen. But when you start seeing cause and effect clearly, okay, then your desires get more in line with what's actually possible. And this way you can learn how to rely on yourself more. So you're not just a slave to craving, you become freed from your craving. And this is combined then with ardency. It was essentially the effort to do all of this as skillfully as you can. If you look at the last three factors of the Noble Path, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, the latter ones actually contain the earlier ones inside them. Right effort starts off with the, the desire and the intent. And the energy you put into sensing what's skillful and unskillful, and then trying to abandon what's unskillful, prevent it from arising again, giving rise to what's skillful in the mind. And then once it's there, trying to maintain it, let it develop. As you move on to right mindfulness, right effort gets included under the term ardency. So right mindfulness includes right effort, adds more on to it, giving you a place to focus, giving you a foundation, giving you a frame of reference. And then right mindfulness and the establishment of mindfulness, that becomes the theme for your concentration as you're focused on the breath, focused on the body in and of itself, developing these qualities of ardency, alertness, mindfulness. That becomes the theme of your concentration. The word here is nimitta. Sometimes people talk about the nimitta of concentration as being a light or a vision. But the canon's use of the word nimitta, or theme here, is the four establishings of mindfulness. That's the theme of your concentration, whether it's the body in and of itself, or the feelings that are related to the breath, mind states related to the breath, mental qualities related to the breath. That's the theme of your concentration. So the practice of concentration includes right effort, right mindfulness in its definition. That's an organic whole, which means that you've got a lot of things to balance out here. This is why it's a skill. This is why we have to practice it. It takes time. And you have to be as observant as possible. to master all the elements of the skill. But essentially what you're doing is making yourself someone that you can rely on. In other words, you tell the mind to focus on something and it stays focused. You tell it to let go of something and it learns how to let go. In this way you begin to develop a sense of refuge, a sense of safety inside. And at the same time, you're offering safety to other people. This is what makes it doubly safe. The Buddha talks about virtue, for example, as a universal gift. When you decide that you're going to stick by a particular precept, no matter what, you're offering safety say, from killing, safety from stealing, illicit sex, lying, the taking of intoxicants. You offer that safety to everybody at all times. And because that safety is universal, you have a part in that safety as well. And the same with meditation. You're here trying to overcome your ignorance, your greed, anger, and delusion. When you're less subject to your greed, anger, and delusion, other people are less subject to it as well. Because you're not inflicting these things on other people, you don't have to Worry about adding the fact that you're adding lots of extra dangers to your life. The path is a safe path. And when you augment it with what they call the Brahma Viharas, the sublime attitudes, that offers more safety as well. And then you learned how to develop the quality of being able to 
extend goodwill to everybody, no matter what. Extending compassion and empathetic joy when it's appropriate. Learning to develop equanimity when it's appropriate. You're developing the heart along with the mind. That offers more safety, too, in several ways. One, when you can develop these attitudes and call them up whenever you need them, you're less likely to act on unskillful impulses. This, of course, requires work as well. It's not the case that our true nature is to be kind and generous. Just as it's not our nature to be nasty and cruel, it's simply that we have these habits. And we've developed them as a skill in some areas, and we're not so skillful in others. What we're trying to practice here is the ability to apply them whenever we can, in all situations. That requires learning how to train your heart as well as your mind. And again, this is why we focus on the breath. Because the breath is one of the elements in our emotions. We fabricate our emotions just in that's the same way that we fabricate our thoughts. We tend to think of our emotions as being more real, as being more true, as being prior to thinking. But they're fabricated as well. They have their physical side, which is influenced by the way you breathe. And the mental side is the way you talk to yourself, the things you say, the things you focus on and the feelings and perceptions that go along with them. And as we practice with the breath, we learn how to shape these elements more consciously. So we can begin to rely not only on our thoughts, but also on our emotions. And these sublime attitudes also offer safety in the sense that they expand our attitudes. The mind gets expanded. The barriers that we used to place on our goodwill. There are certain people which just we could not ever imagine wishing goodwill for. We now we break down the barriers. When we break down the barriers. What we find is that we're overcoming limitations we placed on ourselves. And as the mind expands in that way, the Buddha says the results of your past bad actions gets swallowed up in the more expansive mind state. It's like the difference between being a poor person suddenly meeting up with a debt and being a wealthy person meeting up with the same amount of debt. Say that you have only five cents to your name and you're faced with a $30 debt. The $30 debt is huge. swallows up everything you have, more than everything you have. But if you've got a million dollars and you come up with a $30 debt, it's no problem at all. It's the same with this more expansive mind state. The past bad actions you've done, as the Buddha said, are hardly felt at all, because the mind is so much more expansive now. This is a form of safety that can come from training the heart. Even more so, as your concentration develops and you develop even further insight into the ways that the mind can create suffering for itself. You develop the qualities of mind. You can see through those habits. Let them go. Your mindfulness is continuous. Your alertness is really sharp. Concentration and discernment grow as a result. And these offer protection on all sides. One of the images in the canon of, is of having a fortress on a frontier. Concentration, the Buddha said, is like having good, good stores of food. So even if you're attacked, somebody lays siege to you for days on end, you've got enough food to see you, see you through the siege. Discernment, he said, is like a fortress wall. It's so slick and slippery that the enemy can't climb up it. In other words, your defilements can't overcome your powers of discernment. So you're creating safety for yourself. 
with every aspect of the path. This is why it's wise not to pick and choose, saying, well, I like this part of the path, but not that part of the path. If you leave out parts of the path, it's like having a huge gaping hole in your fortress wall. Or letting mice into your stores of food. You want your practice to be all around, so that your safety is all around. Ultimately, of course, where you really want to get is to the deathless. Something is outside of space and time, and that nothing within space and time can touch. No change, no aging, no illness, no death can touch this. That's when you find your true refuge and harbor. So whatever effort is required in the path, think of it as learning how to make yourself a more reliable person. Because if you can't rely on yourself, what do you have? As I said, there's no shelter in the world. There's no one in charge. Your only safety lies in learning how to make yourself reliable. And it comes from developing these qualities of the mind. Unfortunately, not all the safety is saved for the very end. I mean, the ultimate safety, totally unconditioned, is saved for the end. But in the meantime, you find yourself protecting yourself from all kinds of dangers that otherwise you would have kept on creating. And you also protect yourself against some of your past mistakes. So the more effort you put into the practice, the more safe you are. You offer safety to others as well. So it's a practice that's safe all around. Once you've got this internal refuge, then you're safe wherever you go.